Hi everyone and welcome back. So last time we looked at introducing a literary argument and structuring our opening with a claim and reasons. Today we're going to be looking at the second part of or the third part of argument which is using evidence to support and prove your claim. And we're going to review again, um, sometimes I've, I've called it peel and sometimes I've called it teal. We'll talk about that in a moment too. I know that's been confusing for some people, but um, we're going to look at that method again of proving an argument. And then we're going to look at four sample paragraphs from actual student essays and what they did to revise those paragraphs um, to make them stronger. So, to recap, a common method for supporting a claim is the peel or teal pattern. I'm not sure for this class which one I've used. I may have used both. But at any rate, the T stands for topic sentence, sometimes P for point. This is the controlling idea for the paragraph. It can help, uh, can, it can contain a transition word sometimes to connect it to the previous paragraph. Basically, it's showing your reader what the paragraph is going to be about. And a common mistake, which I don't have any here, but sometimes in 123, what people will do is, uh, 123 is college composition, sorry. So sometimes in college composition, what new writers will do is they'll have something like, this paragraph is going to be about imagery or this paragraph is going to be about symbolism. You don't want to have an announcement like that, but we'll talk about a little bit how to do that, uh, how to have a topic sentence. Evidence is really what we're going to focus on in this lecture. So how to use a quotation, paraphrase, or example, either from the primary source, the primary source is the poem, story, or play that you're looking at, or a secondary source, so an article, an essay, or another critical work. And you're using quotations, typically, sometimes paraphrases, to help prove your claim and your reasons. So if you say the major interpretation should be X and the reason is this, here is a piece of dialogue or here is a piece of a paragraph from the text or here is a sentence from the text that shows this occurring. Um, that sounds very vague, I know, but I'll show you some examples in a minute. A is for analysis. So in this portion of the paragraph, you're going to interpret and explain your evidence. And really, you should have um, I've talked about this before, a one to three ratio, meaning that for every one sentence of stuff from the author or the critic, you have three sentences of your own words. So the majority of the paper should be you explaining and interpreting the evidence and showing how it proves your claim. And then the last part is L, the link. Link your evidence either to your thesis, if you haven't done that already, or you can transition to the next paragraph. So when you put all of this together, what you have is a sentence that shows what the paragraph is gonna be about, a quote, short quotation from the author or a secondary source, a critical source, that is an example of what you are trying to prove, Analysis, where you explain what something means, where you describe the author's message, do you connect to the thesis and show how it proves your point, and then a transition to move to your next point to have a smooth essay where your ideas connect. Every body paragraph could look like this. So let's take a look at some examples. Um, first, I'm going to show you a really good example, and then four where there was kind of a problem, and then again the revision, kind of like we did with the introductions. The most prominent theme in the goblin market is sexual temptation. Okay, that was the person's claim. Their reasons were, uh, one of their reasons was symbolism, and they said that symbolism developed the theme. So here is one of the paragraphs that goes along with that reason. Although many people believe that the story is just for children, it's clear that the two girls are not just buying fruit. 
this is our topic sentence. So what they're saying is there's something beyond the surface. One striking example of symbolism, using that word to connect to the reason, occurs when Rossetti says, there should be a comma here, <laughs> she clipped a precious golden lock, she dropped a tear more rare than pearl. Here, the author uses Laura's beautiful blonde hair as symbolic as her symbolic virginity. Laura cries because of the actual physical pain that accompanies the woman's loss of virginity, uh, etc. So then she has this, the men are portrayed as goblins, which are akin to creatures dark, sneaky, overtly sexual, and wicked, which links to, in addition, the goblins are symbolic of, and then she goes into another symbol. So what we have is a really clear paragraph. Um, I know right away that this idea, not just a story for children, connects to her claim. She's giving me an example, um, a golden lock. She's explaining what that symbol is, not just saying, hey, this symbol is here. And then she kind of goes into more detail and then she connects to her next point. So Laura is losing her virginity. She is almost being uh, assaulted by these goblins. They're dark and sneaky and overtly sexual. In addition, they're symbolic of, and then she goes into the next point. It's a really well-structured paragraph. And if you look at the balance here, I'm gonna switch color. Actually, let me erase. Uh, green. Um, if you look at the balance here, this is what I mean by a short quotation. It is about a sentence long. If you put it all in one line, it would be like a line long, right? So she's not having here a long block quotation. She's a good balance. She's a good organization. Um, she explains very clearly um, her interpretation of this symbol. And then she goes into her next point. It's a really beautiful paragraph except for a typo here and there so let's look at a problem paragraph in this one what I'd like you to notice is there's no topic sentence so the paragraph doesn't really have a focus because of that it goes into summary instead of analysis so what the author of this essay is doing is just sort of telling me what happened in the work not how it's connected to their claim so this is about um, Anthem, which is a novella by Anne Rand. In Anthem, when Equity, upon hours of research in his little cove, finally discovers electricity. It's kind of plot point number one. I'll switch back to red. Sorry, guys. It was a delay. There we go. Um, his first thought is da da da. When he is discovered, he refuses to tell. We see further image of oppression when the House of Scholars completely reject his idea. To me, it's the very definition of oppression. Okay, so here we sort of have interpretation, and I'm not sure here it, it's an image of repression, oppression. It's not really. So there's two problems here. First is that there's no focus you're just recounting this portion of the story so here's what happens first then this happens next this happens finally this happens right one two three four the second problem is that you're using words like image and that it's not an image it's really conflict so um and then also there's first person language right here it's a definition of oppression as they're prejudiced to their own ideas and we're refusing to accept better. So this actually is kind of an interesting nugget of an idea, but it's buried in this unfocused paragraph where I can't really tell what the point is that this person's trying to make. So let's look at the revision. The central conflict of man versus society develops the author's message that education is the key to breaking free from oppression. Awesome. So now we have correct interpretation. It's looking at conflict, not at imagery. 
and we have a very clear topic sentence. I know that you're going to be talking about conflict and probably education in this paragraph. Um, now, here, what is interesting is he kept and properly cited, which he did not before, um, but he kept some summary. So instead of having a quote, he has a little bit of a summary. It's not bad to do that. Um, once in a while, if you have summary in every paragraph, it's not going to work. Similarly, if you have a long quote for every paragraph, it's not going to work. But at any rate, um, equity fights against when he spends hours with scientific experiments. Then he describes the experiments once he's discovered he's questioned and tortured. So he's shortened this up quite a bit to focus on education. He's doing experiments. He's trying to share it with the scholars. He wants to be a scholar. And he's questioned and tortured for doing so. Now we have the analysis. The fact that equity is willing to risk torture and even possible death shows how much he values his scientific education. This is a very important piece of the conflict, and I did not really get that from this person's first version, but they're completely right. It, it really does show that he's valuing his education and his discoveries. Um, he knows that the light of knowledge, again, looking at education, is his path to freedom, freedom from oppression. So now it's all connecting. Before he's left his society, he becomes free in his mind. And then we have the link. The symbolism of light and darkness is used throughout the novella, and it is seen when, and then he went into his second paragraph, which looked at that symbolism. Again, still focusing on education. Um, the only thing is probably he could have spent a little more time on conflict. He had one paragraph and then spent a lot of time on symbolism. That's something to think about, too when you're balancing your paper, not just a paragraph level, but your whole essay. Um, there could have been another paragraph, possibly this time with a quotation. Um, there's a lot there of learning and trying to share things with um, the people that he works with first and then eventually with um, Liberty, right? So having said that though, this is so much more, <laughs> this is so much better than the first version. It's very clear the focus is. We have a, a fairly good um, interpretation. It's a little bit unbalanced, but the interpretation um, is really the key. And now we have a link to the next part, which smooths it out a lot better than the unfocused version we had the first time. All right, problem two, no evidence. Um, so this was actually for a journal entry about a short story called The Little Match Girl. And I asked them to have a claim about whether or not the story had a happy ending. So because of that, there's no real link to the next point um, because a journal entry is just supposed to be a, a, a little bit shorter. Um, so we have a topic sentence and a clear claim. It does not have a happy ending. The problem is that we don't have any evidence to prove this claim. So there's sort of some interpretation. The poor little girl in the story froze to death in an attempt to sell matches so her father would not beat her, although we know she's in a better place. It was an avoidable tragedy. She froze to death and that does not constitute a happy ending. This is actually not bad interpretation, but there's no, there's nothing from the actual story. So what happens is we have a, a thin paragraph. Um, this is four sentences, but a couple of them are kind of shorter and it, it's lacking support. There's nothing to prove the claim. It also kind of looks like the writer either didn't take the time to do the assignment or possibly didn't really understand what the story was about. So they just wrote a couple sentences and, and thought that that was um, enough to sort of explain their understanding of the story. So we don't revise journal entries, but I think that this other from a different student can kind of show you a better example from this same story. While it may seem tragic, the ending of The Little Match Girl, little typos there, <laughs> is actually happy. Okay, different claim, 
neither of them are necessarily right or wrong in this case. It's just how this person has chosen to support it. At the beginning of the story, the narrator describes, so she's got a short quote here, a little bit of a longer quote here for evidence. Trembling with cold and hunger, not sold any matches. Then we have some analysis. This is a testament to how much she was suffering. Now, if you just looked at this, it would look really unbalanced, right? But what's interesting is she kind of played with the formula a little bit. So she has evidence. She has a little bit of analysis. Then she has more evidence. And then she has more analysis. Throughout the story, she lights matches for warmth and fantasizes about better things. And then she gives us some examples. A large iron stove, a roast goose, a Christmas tree, and her grandmother. Um, at the end of the night, she dies and goes to be with her grandmother. And then both fly high. Um, they're no, neither cold nor hunger nor anxiety. They were with God. This demonstrates that her, <laughs> again, typo, her death was better than how she was living. Okay, so... First, examples of how much she was suffering, then examples of how much her life is better, her existence is better um, after death. So it, I have much better proof here um, that supports her claim. And then she does link back to the thesis, though she dies, this death is beautiful, and indeed she has a happy ending. I think that there's a tad bit of a di unbalance between the evidence and the analysis. I would have liked to see maybe a sentence more um, here or here, but she's done a great job proving her idea, her claim with her evidence. She picked relevant quotations and she's playing with this formula. Here's some evidence that she's suffering. Here's some evidence that in death she was not suffering and that her pain was over and therefore it's a happy ending. Um, everything here connects very clearly, much better than just saying, um, you know, it's not a happy ending because she died, period, the end, right? Um, here we have textual examples. All right. Problem number three, kind of like the last one, uh, a little bit too much evidence. So this is about the play Doubt. Sister Aloysius is presented to the reader right of a person. People need to proofread before turning in. Sister Aloysius is presented to the reader as a person who initially obeys the rules and believes in discipline. Um, okay. So we have a very clear topic sentence that the priest is not guilty. And I'm not going to read you this because it's quite long, but what I want you to see is in yellow how much evidence they have. They have one thing from this critic, and they have another thing um, from an interview that the author did. And really, too, the problem here is that they, they also don't connect. So she's very traditional and likes to exert, exert her authority over areas of school life, right? Talking about Sister Aloysius. But then we have this thing about how he describes his mother, who's kind of like the nun. And there's like one, two, three, four, five, six lines here of quotation and about a line and a half of here. So like seven lines of quotes just in this one paragraph. Um, a lot of times people are taught to do what is called a block quotation. A block quotation is when you have a quote that is a little bit longer and you indent it in and you put it into your paper. And I have found that many times people try to use these to have a longer quotation. To make, They use longer quotations to have a longer paper to get the length that they need. Block quotations and long quotations like this are not appropriate for the length of paper that I am assigning you. Again, if you were writing a paper that was 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 pages long, then sure, have a block quotation in there, maybe two, um, maybe three or four if you're writing 40 pages. But for a shorter paper, you want more of your analysis. Even in a longer paper like that, if I had given somebody a block quotation like this with seven lines, I better have 
a whole page and a half explaining those seven lines because I want to have that balance of my words and their words, right? Um, then this analysis, again, is kind of confusing. Shanley describes his mother as always having headaches when she he was young and stating they stopped when he left to see the antagonist. It doesn't it doesn't connect. I mean, we have a couple phrases mirrored by the nun like the nun. The ideas don't really connect and the balance is really thrown off. So let's look at his revision. Here we we kept the topic sentences. It's two sentences, but it's fine. Um, she's presented to the reader as someone who's obeys the rules. The conclusion is that Father Flynn is not guilty. Now we have the short quote from James Irvine. And what the author did here of the paper, I like. He uses his mother as a basis for Sister Aloysius. So now the link is much more clear. In an interview, he states that his mother strictly followed rules to the letter, was unaffectionate, and was a pill. So the blue here is a paraphrase. <clears throat> the yellow is a quote, shortens it up much more clearly. And then in the analysis, following strict rules and protocols, she forces the children. Um, she controls the lessons. And she even tries to control whether or not Father Flynn receives sugar in his tea. Um, so we have these, there we go, and the link to connect the ideas. Like Shanley's mother, Sister Aloysius is unfeeling and unaffectionate. This is a contrast to Father Flynn, who is characterized as a loving priest who, character, who cares about his students. The next paper was about Father Flynn, but what I like that they did in this revision is that they connect, I'm gonna erase, sorry, um, unfeeling and unaffectionate is now connected to here and it's connected here to here and like his mother so his mother is a basis like his mother also like his mother she's unfeeling and affection unaffectionate and strictly following rules follows strict sorry <laughs> follows strict rules and protocol so it what the author has done here is they have used certain words more than once to connect their ideas. And it works so much better. I can finally understand what they're talking about. And it's very interesting um, because it's a connection that not everybody makes, right? And it's showing that, hey, he had mixed feelings about his mother. They didn't really get along. He's based his character on her his mother was a villain in his life and this woman is a villain in the play it's it's a great it's a great inter sorry it's a great interpretation and it, it really is going quite in depth and you didn't get that depth from the first version okay so at first glance the one i'm going to show you next this is our last looks like all of the parts are there but in reality, the author isn't really saying much. They repeat themselves. And the symbol is identified instead of analyzed. This is an important point that I want you to remember. Um, don't just tell me where the symbol is occurring. You need to talk about the significance. So a lot of times when people are starting to write about literature, um, they wanna say, oh, there's a symbol. There's an example of imagery. There is uh, an example of in-depth characterization. There's an example of this type of conflict. And that's the first step. <laughs> and you do need to be able to know where that is occurring. But then you have to go deeper. And I don't know why, but I find especially that this happens with poetry, that people just want to point out where things are happening, but they don't necessarily talk about why or how. So how does it develop the author's themes? Why is it being used? What's the author's message? So here's our example, back to the goblin market. In the goblin, goblin market, the author uses symbolism in the poem. The color of Laura's hair symbolizes her purity before and after she gives into temptation. In the beginning, her hair is gold. After eating the fruit, her hair grew thin and gray. Her hair is graying symbolizes that she gave into temptation. Also, there's a grammatical issue here. 
Uh, it should be the fact that her hair is graying symbolizes giving an attempt, whatever. There are a lot of symbols in this poem besides this one. Okay, so uh, this is possibly to me the most frustrating of par types of paragraphs that I see because like the one that we looked at for um, the little match girl, it's thin. Like the points are sort of there, but the transitions are very clunky. There is symbolism. Yeah, there is symbolism through the whole poem, but why um, is it there? What does it do? There's so many unanswered questions here. So many unanswered questions. So let's look at the revision. So much better. The color of Laura's hair symbolizes her purity before and after she gives into temptation. So the author here reorganized to have this as the claim for the paragraph. It's the topic sentence. It's the controlling idea for the paragraph. Great. Now it's not just vaguely like, hey, there's symbols in this poem. In the beginning, her hair is gold. After eating the fruit, her hair grew thin and gray. Now we've taken out the problem with grammar. We've also added the correct citation. And we have a really nice short quotation as evidence. And then in the blue is the person's analysis. Um, in the beginning of the poem, Laura is childlike. Gray hair represents aging. Laura has gone from child to adult. Um, also, uh, da, 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 it, it's, hair can sometimes turn gray when a person is under stress or extreme duress. Eating the fruit and suffering the consequences put stress on Laura. And age turned in an unnatural way. She is no longer a sexual woman. She is old and grotesque. This, to me, is much more interesting also because, to be honest with you guys, I never really even thought about this idea when I read it. Like, I did think sort of, oh, okay, she's sick. Um, and they don't have here, but, you know, gray, looking gray in your skin can often mean sickness as well. So I sort of thought of it like that. But this is a really interesting interpretation she they've had their their way with her and it's kind of like wham bam thank you ma'am goodbye we're done with you and now she's not really sexually attractive anymore and she's lost her youth along with her innocence then we have the link in comparison lizzie's appearance is symbolic of innocence and resistance of temptation now the next paragraph was all about lizzie and it, it here's the thing. I get so happy about this. It made me want to keep reading because I'm like, oh, that's a really interesting interpretation. What do they have to say about Lizzie? Right. And we have these transitional words in comparison and then our linking kind of idea. We just talked about appearance here. We're going to talk about appearance here. And now we're going to move on to resistance of temptation. So I hope that these examples have given you um, some sort of visual idea of what paragraphs should look like when you're doing this method. Remember, you're doing a topic sentence, um, examples or evidence, analyzing it, and then linking it either to your thesis, linking the ideas together, or linking to your next paragraph. A clear topic sentence is a controlling idea for each paragraph. Topic sentences should connect to your claim or your reasons, one or the other. Make sure that you have relevant quotations. Don't just pick a random quote that doesn't have anything to do with anything. For example, in the last paragraph, if they were talking about symbolism and hair, and then, or they're talking about symbolism and instead they give me, uh, you know, a piece of the setting that has more to do with imagery than symbolism, that make sure that everything is relevant because it should be supporting your topic sentence and helping to prove your claim. Cite your evidence. I don't know why people get this mixed up so much, but it is literally just the author's last name and a space and the page number. If the page number is available, that's all you need. Last name, space, page number. Not the whole URL, not the year for the type of formatting that we're doing. Um, plays are a tiny bit different, but I have a different thing about how to do that later on where you look at the, the, uh, the act and the scene. 
Um, but just the last name and the page. That's it. That's all you need. Put it at the end. It goes after the quotation marks before the period. You can have more than one piece of evidence per paragraph. You, you looked at, you know, two of our examples had two different pieces of evidence. Um, the one about the little match girl, she used a couple different quotes, really short and close together. Um, one of them about doubt had two different quotations from two different critical articles. That's fine. Just try to make sure that you balance the quotation with your analysis. And again, it should be kind of a one to three balance. For every one line of quotation, you have three sentences that are your writing. Analysis should explain and interpret the evidence. Don't just identify where things occur. Ident explain how, why, to what extent. Um, you're telling your reader how things should be interpreted. So that's the, you know, that's the point of the paper. Use transitional words and sentences to connect ideas and help flow from one point to the next. Um, and that is basically it. If you have questions as you go, just let me know. But again, I, I'm hoping that this helped and I can't wait to read your work. Thanks, everybody.